Hi, Lori Montre, trauma-informed eating psychology coach here to talk to you about protein. You may be hearing a lot lately about the importance of prioritizing protein consumption in your diet. Now, it isn't necessarily that this is groundbreaking new information, but we do have a lot more understanding of why getting adequate protein is so vital for fat loss, health, vitality, and even longevity. In this video, my goal is to provide you some of the why behind the science to eat enough protein, how much to eat, when to eat it, and how to make getting enough a little easier. Now, as I start this informational session, I want to speak very clearly to the fact that I encourage people to make their food decisions from the inside out rather than the outside in. And what I mean by that is you're only your body can tell you truly the best way to eat. And there is no one size fits all, especially when it comes to types of food, how many carbs, how much fat is right for you. In my Freedom From Emotional Eating course, I teach people how to stop following those rigid diet rules, tune into their body's wisdom, and find the approach to nourishment that tr truly feels free and allows them to attain their goals, whatever they are. Now, in addition, I know that a lot of you in my community are recovering from or may still be in the stages of trying to break free from diet culture. Diet culture is that rule-based, um, restrictive mindset that leaves you only two options. You can follow the rules and be good, or you're not following the rules and you're bad. Additionally, within diet culture, you don't have the permission to learn and listen to your body. Breaking free of diet culture is so important on the journey to food and body freedom. So it's a little bit different for me to be doing this video about a macro, namely protein, and giving you suggestions. So I want to say two things about this before we begin our discussion. One, I want to tell you why I decided to make this video. And two, I want you to promise me that you'll listen to all of this video, not just the first part. Because in the first part, I'll share with you why I put protein first for myself. And in the second part, I'll talk to you about how you can go about applying this in your life in a way that feels nourishing instead of rule-based and restrictive. At the same time, I know you want to live your best life, right? You want longevity. You want not just longevity, but you want to feel good, right? And I know the power of food to heal to give us what we need to truly thrive. You know, I see people within my community overcome pre-diabetes, diabetes, joint pain, other aches and pains, mood issues, and many, many other ailments by eating the foods that their body needs. Truly, food can be our medicine and a beautiful way that we care for ourselves. So I'm choosing to speak to you about protein because it's important and because I believe it makes a difference in helping you overcome emotional eating. You're gonna hear more about that towards the end of this video. I also want to invite you to turn this video off if you're early on in your journey to overcome emotional eating and it feels triggering to hear anything about what you could, should consider doing with your food. I get it. I was triggered by nutrition advice for decades. If I read something that I should or shouldn't be doing, I would immediately try to go all in fail, and then consider myself a complete failure. So if you're someone who just really needs to focus on not having rules right now, mark this video and come back to it later. Hopefully the way I'm presenting it to you will keep it from being super triggering, but you need to make that decision for yourself. Now again, there are some special attributes um, about protein, which I think warrants this discussion. I believe it can help you break the cycle of emotional eating because it takes the edge off your cravings, gives you more energy, and supports your nervous system in ways that make your other work to overcome emotional eating just a little bit easier. And who doesn't want that? So if you've promised me that you'll stay to the end of the video and watch that, that part where I talk more about um, how to apply it, let's get started. If you want to, you know, regardless of what your goal is, if your goal is to stay healthy, to maintain your muscles, to um, turn your body into a fat burning machine, um, or merely protect the muscle that you currently have, we need to achieve several things. First of all, we have to rebalance the hormones in your body that control our body fat levels so that our body will burn excess fat. We have to 
balance our hunger hormones so we aren't battling hunger and cravings. We have to restructure our cells and make new efficient cells that are capable of burning fat for energy, not just sugar. If we've been used to eating a diet with significant amount of sugar, your cells are structured to take in sugar more than fat for energy. And this in turn leads to pretty intense cravings. We also have to produce the enzymes that burn fat. We have to build muscle since it is the body's single largest source of, of fat burning. Muscle mass is also linked to reduced risk of chronic disease, better recovery from illness, improved health outcomes, and a longer lifespan. For anyone who's interested in diving a little bit deeper into this research around uh, muscle mass and healthier, longer uh, lifespans, look up Peter Atia, A-T-T-I-A on YouTube. He's got so much information there that you would find interesting. Now, all of these things that I'm talking about depend on adequate protein. These function cannot happen without that adequate supply. The problem is most of us are not getting adequate amounts of protein to meet the goals that we have for our bodies. Um, the RDA recommendation is completely inadequate for almost everyone. That research is based on decades old uh, nitrogen balance studies in young men. The studies fail to take into account most of the population and the way in which the protein needs were established is somewhat questionable. To even be able to maintain, let alone build more muscle, we need significantly more protein than the RDA advises. Now I also want to note that our protein needs increase, not decrease as we age. And in the muscle world, that means age 35 and up. It's right around that age that, um, and beyond of course, that it becomes harder for us to get the amino acids from our food and build muscle from them. So in a nutshell, here are the top five reasons to make sure you're getting enough protein. Number one, protein provides us with amino acids. There are 11 total amino acids, nine of which are essential, meaning we have to get them from our food because we don't make them in the body. These nine essential amino acids are required by our bodies daily. If we don't ingest enough of them from, from our food, our body's going to take them from our muscle. Number two, these amino acids are necessary for building and repairing our muscles and bones, for making hormones, as well as enzymes. If we wanna maintain muscles as, as we age or maintain muscle while we're losing weight, we have to consume the protein necessary to feed your muscles. Otherwise, you're automatically losing muscle. Number three, studies show when you consume adequate amounts of protein, you tend to eat less. Why is this true? You know, our bodies never fail to surprise me in their incredible design. So protein is so important for the body. And since our bodies don't easily store protein like they can fat and carbs, it sends out, our bodies send out powerful cravings to get you to eat more food in an effort to get the protein that it needs. A recent study found that our bodies prioritize the consumption of protein over other dietary components, and we are driven to eat until our no protein needs have been met, regardless of how many calories that is. So stated more simply, we keep eating until we sense we've had enough protein. Another reason we tend to eat less when we're consuming adequate protein is because protein actually helps slow down stomach emptying by suppressing ghrelin, which is a hormone secreted by the stomach when it's empty. Protein also impacts two hormones known as GIP and GLP-1. These hormones are the, are the ones that are impacted um, most by the new wave of weight loss drugs like Ozempic, Semaglutide, Wachovia, and others. People lose weight on these drugs because number one, they're less hungry, their appetite changes, and two, these hormones also regulate insulin secretion after eating. Protein has a similar effect on satiety and blood sugar stability. Making aligned choices is so much easier when you're not feeling ravenous and your blood sugar is relatively stable. Two things that are helped by eating adequate protein. Number five, Protein has a high thermic effect. Now the thermic effect of food is how much energy you spend 
digesting and absorbing the food you eat. Carbohydrates and fats require only about 5 to 10% of the food you eat um, in order for, for that food to be absorbed and digested, and while protein requires 20 to 30%. So what that means is if you eat 100 calories of fat or carbs, you're going to net 90-95 calories. But if you eat 100 calories of protein, you're going to net 70 to 80 calories. So even if you ate the same amount of food, same amount of calories, switching out more protein for carbs and fats means you'll automatically be burning more calories. So these are five powerful reasons why you should prioritize protein. And then here are some other facts that I want to share with you um, about protein. First of all, there's a difference between plant and animal protein. When we talk about protein, we have to consider uh, protein digestibility, right? How easily our bodies can use it the quality and the amino acid profile within the protein source, which amino acids does it contain. Um, animal protein generally has a more optimal amino acid profile and is more digestible. Now remember, we need all nine essential amino acids to be present in the body at the same time in order to turn on protein synthesis. That's an important point because we can't eat seven of the amino acids one day to the next day and think we're covered because they won't be present at the same time. Remember I said our bodies don't do well storing um, protein and amino acids. So plants tend to be low in one or more of the amino acids. So often you're going to need to eat a lot more of a plant protein to get the amount of amino acids that you need to do the job. And since many plant proteins don't have all nine essential amino acids, you have to think about the combination of plant proteins that you're eating in close proximity to each other to make sure you have all nine on board in the right amounts. Another challenge with plant protein is that plants come along with significant amount of carbs or fats. So in order to eat enough of the food you, to get adequate protein, you may have to consume more fats or carbs than is in alignment with the other goals that you have. Now, I'm not suggesting that you shouldn't be vegan or vegetarian if you're committed to that way of eating, but there are some real hurdles to get over if you want to make sure that you're getting adequate amino acid intake through your plant protein. Now, here would be a good time for me to note that some of the research suggesting that meat is unhealthy or that a plant-based diet is better for you um, have been shown to be questionable because the type of meat that's often used in the studies is factory-raised meat. And there is a huge difference between feedlot, factory-raised meat, and wild, pasture, grass-fed, and grass-finished meats. What your food has eaten is just as important as what the food itself is. Animals that are fed filler foods such as corn, soy, other low-quality foods in order to fatten them up have no place in your body. In the factories, they are doing things to fatten these animals up. Um, the, and fish too, which are full of pesticides, herbicides, fungicides, and hormones that are then stored in their fat. So when we eat the animals, we're getting the toxins that these animals are being fed. But meat and fish that has been properly fed has many health benefits. So if you're a vegan or vegetarian for health purposes, you may want to explore how incorporating clean animal protein could actually improve your health. So I'll mention... Um, there is the option of using some high quality plant-based uh, protein powders that are crafted to ensure that you do get the right amount and mix of amino acids but there are so few that are actually clean and many powders contain ingredients that don't work um, for certain bodies like dairy um, sometimes soy sometimes um, definitely artificial ingredients um, and more on protein powders on, on another day but on a little side note that I want to mention about increasing your intake of protein is this. If you're someone who has a problem digesting meats or haven't eaten much meat or protein for that matter um, in, the, in the recent past and then you up your protein intake, you may want to consider taking a high quality digestive enzyme at least for a while and then seeing if you can taper off it if you want as your body starts to produce the enzymes needed to digest protein. Sometimes people will say, well, I kind of gave up meat for the most part, and now when I eat it, I get a stomach ache. And it very well could be that your body stopped making the enzymes needed to digest meat or heavy protein because it didn't need them. It's not a problem. It's just the fabulous, adaptable body. 
So if you're ready to take a closer look at your protein, let's talk about how much and how to make it a little easier to work that into your life. Bottom line is almost everyone needs at least 100 grams of protein. And if we can get a little bit more specific, we would use your weight multiplied by 0.7 or uh, 1. Okay, so let's say we're taking your target weight into account. Okay, this is the weight that you'd feel comfortable and your body would like to be at. So if your target weight is say 150, we'd multiply that by 0.7 and by 1. This would give us a range of 105 to 150. If you have all the muscle you want, you're feeling amazing, don't have weight to lose, feel at your best from a health standpoint, that's 0.7, which is probably just fine. But if you are under stress, recovering from an injury, if you're vegan or vegetarian, you're sedentary, you're over 35, uh, you want to maintain or build muscle, especially during weight loss, you're much better served by meeting the 1.0 multiplier. So how do we break that up? You know, the first meal of the day should be heavy protein. Uh, the reason for that is, there's a few reasons, but one is that you've gone a long time without eating, 10, 12 hours or more, and we, during that time, you go into muscle protein breakdown. And in order to reverse that, we want to provide around you know 30 or more grams of protein. We need at least 2.5 grams of the amino acid leucine in order to stop muscle protein breakdown and get back into muscle protein synthesis. Now, the same is true for your meal in the early evening. By making sure that these two meals are solid in the protein department, you can spend less time in breakdown and more time in synthesis. Now, this doesn't mean you should eat late at night or first thing when you wake up. We need that break to clean things up and let our digestion rest. But if, you're ma if we're making sure that our morning and our evening meals are between 30 and 60 grams of protein, we're going to reduce the amount of time that we're um, spending in muscle protein um, breakdown. Now your midday meal, you could provide the rest, right? Um, if you're more of a two meal a day person, then um, you may need to get a supplemental source of protein that might be important for you to meet your, meet your requirements. Now, since we need, like I said, at least 2.5 grams of leucine to go into muscle protein synthesis, you're going to need a pretty good dose of protein to do that. So for that reason, it is preferable to break up your protein into these two or three meals and consume larger amounts at a time as opposed to dripping protein throughout the day because you might not hit the requirements that 2.5 of leucine needed to shift into muscle protein synthesis even though you're consuming protein a little here and a little there. Don't worry if all of this sounds complicated. It's really not when you get a little structure that works for you. So I'm going to share with you some ideas on how to set up your structure. Lord knows I've worked hard to figure out what can work uh, for me. So let me say, first of all, we cannot rely on protein powders and bars. Okay, These are usually not clean sources of protein. They're often full of less usable protein right, um, than whole food protein. And there's a lot of ingredients in these types of foods that ruin our digestive systems over time, feed harmful bacteria in our gut. So it may be easy in the short term um, to rely on these sources, but in the long run, they will not help you reach your goals. But look, I get it. Why? Once I committed to getting 130 grams of protein a day, I struggled for weeks trying to find a system that would work for me. Now, I'm not saying this is the only way. Um, that you can be successful, but this will give you some idea of how it can be done. The goal is to get as much whole food protein as possible. So we can shoot for 30 to 40 grams per meal for a woman, 50 to 60 for a man of whole food protein. Now, assuming you're eating three meals a day, that would give a woman 90 to 120 from whole food right off the bat, 150 to 180 whole food protein for men. Um, so what does that look like? You know, um, chicken, turkey, pork, ground beef, lamb, those are about seven grams per ounce of meat. Steak has a little more around 8.5. Um, fish typically has around six grams per ounce. Uh, a cup of black beans, 15. An ounce of cheese, seven. An egg, six or seven. Three tablespoons of hemp seed, 9.5. Um, there's so many resources online. Uh, all you have to do is just put in the food that you're wondering about and put in the protein amount, right? 
And I really suggest that you keep a list in your kitchen. Every time you look something up, just write it down. These are the things that you regularly include and then you have your list handy. Um, now, in addition to the whole foods, there are two non whole food based products that I use to to make sure I hit 130. One is Perfect Aminos by Body Health. Perfect Aminos provide your body with the exact building blocks of protein in a form that it can fully absorb and use no matter what the state of your digestive tract is. Um, many people really notice a decrease in cravings after taking Perfect Amino, as well as fat loss just kind of occurring naturally. I use one or two servings a day, which gives me between 15 and 30 extra grams of protein, um, which helps me meet my goal. Uh, the other cool thing about Perfect Aminos is it comes with virtually no calories. Now, keep in mind I consider this a supplement to your whole foods, not a substantial part of your protein intake. The other product I use is called Transformation Protein Powder. Um, these are available online. Now, I'm not saying that this is the only high quality uh, powder out there, but I really love it because it is a blend of egg white and plant protein to promote lean muscle growth, has a unique blend of MCT oil and other essential nutrients that really help keep you satiated and boost your metabolism all day long. It's also enriched with a bunch of things that we need to so our protein that we do eat works better. Prebiotics, probiotics, digestive enzymes, and fiber. And these things also help brain function and speed up digestion. There's pure collagen peptides um, and the threshold amount of leucine that I mentioned. So, you know, there's a lot of protein powders out there, so, so many, as, you know, the importance of protein is being, um, you know, we're being reminded of it, but much of the protein powders, they're not, the protein in them is not bioavailable, and they're full of ingredients that are just unhealthy for us. If you struggle getting enough protein through whole foods, these two products can be very helpful in supporting you. Now, as I said, I use both of them regularly, but I find them especially helpful if I'm traveling and I don't have as much control over my schedule or, or my food choices. So here's the part of the video um, that I made you promise to watch in the beginning. I know there was a time in my life when if I heard any information about what I should do with respect to food, I would immediately set up a hard and fast rule for myself wherein if I followed the rule, I was good. If I didn't, I was bad. So I really want to first of all invite you to consider my thoughts on protein from the standpoint of just a way to nourish your body with energy and strength rather than a hardcore rule to follow. You can also recognize protein as a tool to help you overcome challenges with food because if you're going to achieve that, right, you, you have to learn how to work with your habituated pathways. You have to learn how to work with an overactive nervous system and you have to learn to be aware of feelings and be able to process them without needing to numb, distract, or avoid. These, are, these three things are the keys, the three keys that I teach in my Freedom from Emotional Eating program. And adequate protein helps you in that work because it nourishes your body, your hormones become more balanced, cravings get a little bit easier to manage, Protein doesn't take the place of needing to do the underlying work that of the three keys, but it can make your work easier. Now, as you're taking in this information about protein, thinking about how you want to integrate this in your body, I really want to invite you not to turn this into a moral dilemma. You cannot be good or bad because you meet your protein goal. The information I'm sharing with you is simply an invitation to take better care of your body in better and better ways all the time, right? It's not something that you have to start doing on Monday. So here's some ideas to think about as you're considering your plan. Number one, you never have to go all in on day one. That's the all or nothing thinking that has led you to failure and frustration so many times. When I started looking at my protein for the goals that I wanted, which is to build and maintain my muscle in my second half of life, I didn't jump in. I didn't say, oh man, I need 130 grams of protein every day. Ready, go, right? I knew better because that kind of approach backfires every time. And as a behavior change specialist, I know that's the last thing that would bring me success. Instead, I knew I had to ease into it thoughtfully. So the first thing I did was notice where I was, how much protein I was truly getting consistently and what would be easy for me to switch around or to start to incorporate. 
Now, to be honest with you, with my 30 years of chronic dieting, I can still get triggered around rules with food. And this is one of the things that I help people deal with in my freedom program. I help them nourish their bodies, make decisions that feel good without getting wrapped up in a restrictive diet mindset. So I started this experiment with protein and it's all just an experiment, right? I'm the lead scientist on all things related to my body. Um, I started this experiment from the standpoint of curiosity and from the desire to provide an awesome future for my old lady self. When I'm 75, 80, and 95, I want to look back and thank this version of me today for taking good care of us in a way that allows me to still be doing the things I love, to get around, to live independently, to feel good. I plan to still be running, jumping, and playing for a very long time. So I invite all of you to approach this experiment with protein in the same way, with curiosity, without attaching morality to yourself. So for my experiment, I decided to set a small goal and then use that goal to collect data and tell me what my starting point was. So I said, okay, I'm gonna shoot for getting 20 grams of protein in every meal, just as a way to help me see where I was and how challenging this might actually be. And I was a little surprised. There were meals during the week where I didn't necessarily have the exact thing planned. I do have a pretty good meal planning and prepping system um, because I want my choices to be really easy, but every single meal is not planned. Um, most, most are because I do, like I said, I like my choices to be easy for me. I do a lot of planning and prepping at times when, um, when it's easy for me. Right, So those times when my food was not already planned or prepared, I was putting together meals, quick meals of mostly vegetables or vegetables and a little carb and there really wasn't much protein at all. Oh, that's interesting. So this experiment showed me where my starting point was. And this is the way I teach people to develop change by using a ladder approach, right? You find out where you are, where you wanna go, and then you work on how to build a ladder to get you there, right? You build and move up the rungs as you feel ready. And that is when you feel nice and secure on the rung you're at. Then it's time to start thinking, okay, what's the next rung look like? So for me, my first goal was to hit that 20 each of the three meals in the day. And when this got really easy, I just started noticing what would help me be able to hit 30 at every meal. I was already doing it a lot, but what did I need to do, right? I tried a few things on. Some of them worked, some of them didn't work, and over the course of a few weeks, I found some things that did. So I built my ladder rung by rung, week by week, making small adjustments, trying them on to see how they felt. Sometimes what I worked, what I tried worked great, other times wasn't really very helpful. And here's another point I want to stress. When I moved up my goal, I didn't just say, okay, here's what's happening. I'm gonna do 40 at breakfast, 30 at lunch, and, and 40 at, at uh, dinner. Um, I didn't just say that. I said, and what do I need to be successful, right? That meant that when I was doing my meal planning at the beginning of the week, I really thought about what those sources of protein would be and when I would prepare them. Because sometimes, oftentimes, we have great intentions, but life doesn't always go along with our plan. And that's why part of the structure I teach people is how to deal with those unplanned circumstances before they happen. So it's really important that you set your goal, yes, but also back that up and ask yourself, how can I support you in meeting that goal? What do you really need to be able to do that? Not just do it, right? Another thing to keep in mind about building your ladder is this. Don't feel like just because it's been two weeks or even a month that you've been on a particular rung that you have to move up. If your ladder rung has not started to feel relatively easy, it's not time to build the next one. All of this is part of the habit building process that I teach in my Freedom From Emotional Eating program because what really works is a supportive structure, right? Rather than pushing yourself day in and day out to do something that's beyond where you are. That's a really important key to not triggering the nervous system. Don't set yourself up for failure and for having to rely heavily on willpower. Willpower is a muscle. It gets fatigued. So stop telling yourself to just do better and instead ask yourself, what is making this ladder run hard? Taking things 
one rung at a time, right, also protects you from overwhelm shutdown, in which you're standing at the bottom of the ladder and you're hyper focused on the top, thinking, oh my God, it's so far up there, right? I'll never make it. And the good news is you don't have to. All you have to do is make it to the next rung. The run, and that rung, right, is just a little bit from where you are. So, just to recap this section, you cannot be good or bad depending on whether you meet your protein for the day. When you don't get to the number you're shooting for, you simply say, oh, okay, is there something I can do to help myself tomorrow? Number two, make sure that you are following this step-by-step -step ladder rung approach, building towards where you want to be. It doesn't matter how long it takes you to get there, okay? You're checking in with yourself every seven days, gathering and evaluating the information from the week before. And remember, there's no room for judgment, only data collection. How did that work for me? What can make it easier? Oh, it was easy? Awesome. Let me move to the next ladder rung. Here's what, what feels like it's very doable to me, or whatever the next step is. Right. The third thing I'll invite you to try on is to don't work on trying to make a bu other, another bunch of changes at the same time. Don't do a sugar cleanse and attempt to get 10 days, a, 10 a day servings of vegetables all at the same time, right? Just try on the protein and just see what other effects naturally come up from this one change. Trying to do too much is going to put you back in that space of restriction and struggle, and you'll likely fight back against that restriction. This is going to put you right back at square one, and you don't need to do that. There's a better way. Just think about the protein and the rest will come when this is easy for you, right? Watching yourself succeed with protein is gonna help you develop skills and tools that you can then apply to the underlying work with your habituated pathways, your nervous system, and the emotional resilience, which will also help you develop that nourishing relationship with food. So go gently. Don't try a bunch of other things all at the same time. At the end of the day, it's not that serious. It's something to think about and be mindful of, right? But switch the view of food from something you have to battle against to something that can nourish your body and your future self. Nutrition is an incredibly beautiful way that we care for ourselves. But I know it can be challenging from a practical standpoint. So if you also have challenges with food like emotional eating or chronic dieting, this is especially true. Um, but once again, this is a big part of the work that I do with people in my Freedom from Emotional Eating program. So if you're someone that would like some support around how you can both nourish your body and have a healthy relationship with food, I really encourage you to check out the program. Um, as always, I would love to hear from you, answer your questions about the protein or about other things um, with respect to your relationship with food. And... You can check out the program at www.freedomemotionaleating.com. My email for your questions is lori, L-O-R-I, at lori montry, M-O-N-T-R-Y, dot com. So I very much look forward to hearing how your experiment goes and how I can support you in it.